you find the majority of your Bible is this, and that all covers the Jewish nation. All of this in your Bible covers the Jewish nation. And how much of that do you know? And that's what we are to know, and that's what we're studying. We're going to study Israelology. So we looked at their creation, and we'll look at that again as we go through. We looked at their being chosen by God. God chose them unto himself, and we'll look at that as well. We looked at their calling, and that brought us up to the covenants. We looked last week at the covenant that God had made with Noah, and at the end of that covenant structure, we saw the verse in Luke chapter 17 and verse 26, where he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the son of man. And so we're asking ourselves, are we looking for these signs to occur? Is that what we're looking for? But now, depending on your eschatology, your view of the end time, what they are looking for is Christ coming right before his kingdom. That does totally away with the tribulational period. That does totally away with the war with Russia and her six uh, allied nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39. That does totally away with the 75-day waiting period before you enter into that messianic kingdom. What do you do with those time periods? Are they yet future? And that's why I said when we're studying Israelology, after their covenants, we're going to go into their chastening And that will be the 70th week of Daniel. I think that that's still future. I don't think that that's now. I don't think it's past. I think there are uh, a lot of evidences that show that uh, throughout the scripture. And then we'll go into their conversion, which happens at Christ's coming before the Messianic kingdom. And then we'll go into the kingdom itself. And then those who contend that there is no Israel, the church has replaced Israel. Now, when we were looking at the end of Luke chapter 17, we noticed that Jesus was telling them, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at at the days of the Son of Man. And so we're asking, are we looking for those signs? Are we not looking for those signs? And that led us to another outline, and you should have that line. If you don't have it, it's on uh, the website, on your Sunday school website. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also the days of Son of Man, it looks something like that without all the markings on it. Of course, those are my notes. But that's the outline that we'll be going through. And uh, I wanted to bring up just a couple of things uh, before we get into our, our section. And I'll let me put this up for you, having to do with signs when we look at that. There are two basic meanings to signs when we're looking at it. When we're looking at scripture, a sign or a distinguishing mark whereby something is known, it's a signal or a, a token or an identification. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and you can see in verse 22 that, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe, and so we see that, right? And you can see that in various passages uh, as he quotes from Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, and he says in verse 9 that little babes are the ones who need to be taught and retaught, and so that's what he's talking about, and he gives other examples of people who need to be taught, uh, people who are in need in verse 9, people who are babblers as they talk about in Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, or madmen, as they talk about in 1 Corinthians 14. You can look at that as well. And then there is another meaning for the word sign, an event or an indication or a confirmation of of intervention that is is of uh, transcendental powers, that is outside of this world. A good example of that would be found in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus is, at, or Luke chapter 11 is, excuse me, and a couple of verses there. So if you look at them or just listen, Luke chapter 11 and verse 16, others testing him, sought, and sought from him a sign, ek, or out of heaven, from heaven. They wanted a sign that was outside of the world. You see what they're saying? That's what we want to see, Jesus. We want to see a a sign done from you that's outside 
of heaven. Verse 29, the same thing. And while the crowds were beginning to gather together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. You see that? And so we see that signs are given. Signs are given all throughout the Old Testament. Signs are given throughout the New Testament. And we'll look at some of those signs as we go. The word of God is a sign, we're told, in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and, or excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Exodus chapter 13. We're told that the word of God is a sign. They use the phylacteries. Remember the bands they wrapped around their wrist and they had a box on? Well, they had a headband with a box on their forehead. They had scripture in there that they learned to and they meditated on. And so the word of God is a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. It exposes what's there and it shows them the way to go, you see. And so the word of God, in a sense, is a sign. Creation is a sign. We looked at that and saw that. The mark that God had put on Cain is a sign. But that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a different set of rules. And if you look at your outline on the Old Testament side, it says that the Jews require a sign. And we looked at that. Of course, the word sign, the Hebrew word sign here is oath. It means a signal or a beacon, an omen, literally or figuratively. It's translated 77 times in the Old Testament. But we're told that the Jews require a sign. And that sign they wanted to see was the resurrection. And, of course, that didn't help them. And we know that from reading Romans chapter 9, verses 31 to 33. Israel was delivered by signs. We've read that before. And it wouldn't hurt for you to understand this in, Levit in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. And, again, if I get going too fast and I start uh, giving you uh, references that are incorrect, let me know that. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 34, or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, signs, wonders, by war, by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, by great terrors, according to all that Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. He's talking about the Jews when they were in Egypt. To you it was shown that you might know that Yahweh himself is God and there is none other beside him. So God drew, drew out the, the Hebrew people unto himself. Now when you look at the covenants as we looked at the um, Noahic covenant, we've seen that the covenant signs are given as well. Uh, Deuter or Genesis chapter 9, maybe you're not familiar with that. But look at Genesis chapter 9, or just mark down the reference. The covenant signs are signs that God has given to go along with his covenants that he had made with the children of Israel. Chapter 9 and verse 12. As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you. Oh, excuse me, that's verse 9. But in, in um, chapter 9 and verse 12, he says this, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, every living creature that is with you for, a per for perpetual generations. Verse 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Verse 17, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So when we see the rainbow in the clouds, it is a sign that God is saying, I will never again destroy the earth, even though man's wickedness still prevails. We see that in chapter 8 in the book of Exodus. You might think, well, surely the flood conquered that, and it helped, and man is probably better now. But if we look in chapter 8, verse 21, it says, The Lord smelled the smooth, uh, the soothing aroma. Then Yahweh said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although, this is afterward, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. See, that all but eight, of course, God had destroyed. So we see that. We see that the Exodus was a sign. And we, we see that in Exodus chapter 3, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy. We see that both Moses and Aaron performed signs. We see the covenant signs in relation to the Abrahamic covenant, which we may be getting into. And you see that in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 11. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 11. 
And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He is talking to Israel. The covenant sign of uh, the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision, and that is specifically between God and Israel. Now, you can make it between God and whoever you want, but the scripture says that God says, this covenant sign is between me and Israel. Paul affirms this in Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. If you want to look there or just listen, Romans chapter 4 and verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So he received the sign of circumcision. You see that again? The signs are uh, linked to uh, the covenants that God makes. And then uh, last week I said, and uh, I couldn't remember where it was, I told you that uh, the Exodus is a sign uh, as well. I told you it was in Exodus 31. It's uh, Exodus, excuse me, 21. It's Exodus 31 and verse 13. And in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13, you see this. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you will keep, you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. The Sabbaths are a sign between God and his covenant people, Israel. And remember, God covenanted only with Israel. Not with the church. The church is nowhere in the scene back here. It's just between God and Israel. You see that? And that's what we're studying. Uh, you can see the same thing in Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 and 20. God's covenant discipline also was a sign. And we see that all throughout. Now remember, here's the difference. When God makes a covenant with Abraham, which we'll see, there's no, it's unconditional. It's unilateral. There are no promises that Israel must accomplish. But when you go to the Mosaic covenant, which we'll see, it's totally different. This is a bilateral. It's the only bilateral covenant, meaning there are two people who are obligated to hold conditions. Now you say, well, where do you get that? Well, look in Exodus chapter 19. Let me just give you a couple passages to think about. God calls them out. He calls them out unto himself to bring them unto himself. And notice in verse 8 what he says after he brings them out unto himself. He makes them a, he's going to make them a holy people. And you'll see that in verse 5. Notice the, the conditionality here in the verses. Now, therefore, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. And we've seen that, that verse a special treasure to me above all the peoples of the earth, which is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And these words which you shall speak to, these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now notice verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, all that, the, that Yahweh has spoken, we will what? We'll do. We'll do it. We'll do everything that God says. Remember, while Moses is getting the commandments up on the mountain, they're down in the valley making a golden calf. They're breaking the very first commandment while it's being given. But that's not the only place that they say that. Look at chapter 24. And again, what I want you to see is that this is conditioned. They, 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 uh, they say we will do whatever God says for us to do. And notice chapter 24, verses 3 and 7. So as Moses came and he told all the words uh, that Yahweh and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahweh has said, we will do. We'll do them. We are obligating ourselves to fulfill the covenant responsibilities, which is what they're saying. Verse 7, again, then he took the book of the covenant and he read in the hearing of the people and they said, all that Yahweh has said, we will do and be obedient. So they are linking themselves to God. You see the same thing in chapter 26 and verse 17. And that's, that is where we left off last time. Is there any uh, sort of questions or clarifications that 
uh, we needed to look at or wanted to bring up in regard to any of that? Are you with me so far? The Jews require a sign. They were built on signs. They see signs. The covenant signs are linked to them and associated with them. None of it is linked to the Gentiles. It's all linked to God's people, the Jews, right? Christ's birth, number eight there, is a sign. Look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 12 and 34. Luke 2, 12, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. They're looking for Messiah. That's who they're looking for. 400 years of silence. And now they're being told, listen, here's where the Messiah is. Here's how you can know where he is and you can find him. Verse 34, then Simon blessed them and he said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child, speaking of Jesus, is designed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. See that? Christ's birth is a sign. Even the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And I know that you're very familiar with that passage. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So the birth of Christ also is a sign. And God has worked with his people, the Jews, throughout uh, their history to give them signs and wonders. But you and I, as the church, we don't walk by signs. We don't walk according to signs. We walk by what? We walk by faith and not by sight. You see that? We're not told to look for signs. And so that's what we're going to look at here as we, as we move along. Uh, look at your other page, the, the second half of your paper, if you flip that over. It gives you the Greek word, semion, which is an indication, especially of something ceremonial or supernatural. It's used 69 various times. Uh, in the, in the uh, New Testament, Jesus confronted the leadership of his day uh, through these signs and wonders. Let's see if I can find my paper. I may not be able to. But look at Matthew chapter 16 and notice with me, if you will, verse 3. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 3. Here we go. Sorry about that. Matthew 16 and verse 3. And notice what Jesus says here. So let me read verses one and following. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign out from heaven. See, they want to see something supernatural. He answered and said to them, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky but you cannot discern the signs of the times. You know what he's saying to them? You have no idea where you're at in history. You have absolutely no idea where you're at in history. And that's the question this morning. Do you know where you are at in history? Do you know that the Bible is a historical book and within that historical book, you live and I live. We are, we are dwelling within the pages here. This word that he uses, the time, kairos, you can see it various other places. Like Luke, here's an example of how they were wrong. Luke chapter 19. This is where Jesus rides into uh, Jerusalem. And notice what is said in verse 44, if you, you're not aware of this. Luke chapter 19 and verse 44. 
said, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not understand the kairos, the specific time, the special time that God had announced. Remember, they were looking for Messiah to come, and Nehemiah had prophesied hundreds of years ago when he would come. This was the time when he came, and when he came, they had no clue who he was. As a matter of fact, they said, all that you're doing, you're doing by the power of the devil, not by God. You see that? There's another place that this used, and there's several places, but just for an example so that you can understand this, 2 Thessalonians is another place where, that is, where this is used in chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And again, this word is used uh, multiple times throughout the, the scriptures. I think it was like 89, 82 times, something like that. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and notice verse 6. Speaking of the man of sin, he says, And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own kairos, in his own specific time. There is something, I believe it's God the Holy Spirit, who is restraining the Antichrist from revealing himself. But there is a specific time, according to this verse, that he will reveal himself to all who are there. See that? Any thoughts or questions on that so far? <coughs> all right, you're awful quiet this morning. That's all right. We'll keep going. The Jews, number two, wanted a sign. That's what they want. That's what they started with. That's what Moses gave them. That's what Elijah and Elisha gave them. And this is what Jesus and the apostles, and we'll see that, will give them as well. But the Jews want a sign. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. And again, you're not going to find anywhere where the church is looking for a sign of Christ's return. We're looking for, we're waiting for Christ to appear. That's what we're waiting for. You see that? So Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Yeah, and then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. We want to see a sign from you. We want to see a sign, a miraculous sign from you. Chapter 16, verse 1, we just went there and, and we just read there how that they were looking for a sign in chapter 16 and verse 1 of Matthew. Then the Pharisees, Sadducees came testing him and, at, and that he would show them a sign out from heaven. They want to see a sign out from heaven. And you can look at this very, uh, various other places in Luke's gospel, uh, in Mark's gospel. Listen to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And again, we're talking about the signs of the time, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. That's his second coming. We looked at the signs of the time and how they parallel our society today, but we're looking for a sooner return, if you believe that the rapture is before the second coming of Christ. Now, look here at uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 18 and 11. Luke chapter 2, verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you do to show us since you do these things? What sign are you going to show? This is after he does this miracle of the water and the wine. And Cana of Galilee and men Jews wanted a sign. The Jews wanted a sign. They always want a sign, right? The Bible goes on to say that an evil and a an evil generation seeks after a sign. And that's what we're looking at now. An evil generation seeks after a sign. Look at Luke chapter 11 again. And he's very clear in this and other passages, Matthew as well, but Luke chapter 11. And notice verse 29 and 16. The crowds were gathered together, and he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks what? A sign. Are you seeking for a sign? Because Jesus said it's an evil generation that's seeking after a sign. Right? 
Hang on just a minute. He's coming up this way. Let me read this verse uh, for you, uh, this other verse for you again in, um, in Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 16. Again, he says, others testing him, sought from him a sign out from heaven. So again, they're constantly looking for signs, crying out for, for signs. Yeah, I was just going to ask, you know, what, what would you say are some ways right now that Christians might be looking for a sign? You know what I mean? What are, like, what's something that maybe a believer would do that would be inappropriate, you know what I mean, or, or be categorized as sign-seeking? Well, when you sell all your stuff and sit on the mountaintop in your pajamas and wait for the Lord to come, that would be an indication you were off a little bit, which some people have done, right? Some people have done that. Many people have done that, right? What would be some signs that you would say that people are looking for that expect to, how many times have you worked with people and they looked at the society around them and they've said, well, Jesus must be coming. Look at how bad it's getting. That doesn't mean anything, right? He is coming. Are you ready is the question. Are you ready when he gets here, right? Any other thoughts or questions? Or I would just say, you know, I, I, think, I think I see people at times individualizing everything. Like if God really exists, you know what I mean? Then, I, you know, I prayed. I asked God to show me a sign that he was real. And it was like, I didn't see that sign. And, and I think that's a good response to them. You know, it's, the, the signs already happen. And his, his name's Jesus, and he rose from the dead. You know what I mean? So anyway, anyhow, yeah. Anybody else? Would you think that you had to push the button up on the mic. Is it on? Oh, okay. So would you would you think that? In, Can you in, speak louder? I can't hardly hear you for real. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's your wife's ear. It's like, we won't look. Just go ahead. <laughs> um, so would you say that in in it would be in the same category as people that? feel they are Christians or if they feel like they are doing something or, or going to do something or not going to do something because of some sign or some kind of thing that they would they would equate with, um, you know, a sign from God, would it be in the same category as, you know, maybe that was something of maybe their belief or their direction or whatever the case may be? Now, there's a, let me ask you this question. What's the difference between providence and a sign? We, we look at what a sign is, right? We looked at the various meanings of signs. What about the providence of God? How is that different? Oh, I don't know what my guys are back here doing. You lost your screen back here, guys. They're looking for signs. <laughs> Whoever's looking for signs, there's there's one right there. No signs given. Anybody else? Yeah. Hey, can you uh, find somebody to fix that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just this eclipse coming up. I'm seeing, you know, but, um, Facebook posts with scripture. Can you address that? Say that again. The eclipse, the, the, the solar eclipse. Uh -huh. And I see on Facebook pages, you know, people quoting scripture. There'll be signs in the sky. Uh -huh. What can you, can you address that? As far as what, what do you want to know? <laughs> I mean, what's your, what's your answer? Uh, remember before the red moon came and showed how many people, Christian people, supposedly pastors, were, were writing books on this. Did you get it, Randy? This is movable class right here. <laughs> Did you get it? No. 
Yeah, we just need Randy to shake it up a little. All right. Once Randy shakes it up, we're good to go, I think. So when they had the blood red moons, you've seen all these pastors who are writing books about the Lord's going to come. It's a blood red moon. What were they doing that for? It's money. I mean, if you know enough to know how to pastor and to know how to write a book on your own, then you know that that's wrong. You're just making money. I mean, as far as signs and wonders in the sky, I'm not looking for any signs. I'm looking for Jesus. That's all I'm looking for. And I can't wait to see him. You know, it doesn't matter what happens between now and then. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on in my company and with my company, but still, I'm still looking for the Lord. It doesn't matter anything else that happens, right? That's what I'm looking for, all right? Anybody else? Again, what do you do? What is the issue if you're looking for signs? Remember, we've already been told an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. We've already had Messiah come once. Now we're waiting for him to come again. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for him to come again. And that's what we'll see at the end. Bill? Yeah, Michael. Um, Michael, I think an important topic is, I think you implied it, is imminency. We're supposed to live like Christ is imminently going to return. So we should live each day that way. Yes. So it's not that we always don't think about it, but we don't seek for signs. Um, I think it's mainly been a problem among dispensationalists because in the past there's been a lot of predictors of dates and times among dispensationalists that have caused problems. And you kind of implied about the doomsday prepper type person, which is also problematic. Um, But there is, Matthew 24 talks about what the end times are going to be like. Jesus yeah. talked about it. So there are evidence of the signs of the days of Noah that are going to be there. So it, it's not that it's not there, but we don't dwell on that. We don't look for signs, but we just live for his eminent sure. return. Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have the shake there like uh, Randy. Okay. All right. Well, that's all right. We'll uh, we'll deal with it or not deal with it. We've been dealing with it for quite some time now, right? So, signs are condemnation for who? For some? For none? For all? Uh, when you look at Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 8, and you look at verses 11 and 12, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign out from heaven, testing him. They're always testing him. But he sighed deeply in the spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them. He didn't say as it was in the days of Jonah or it'll be just like it was in the days of Jonah. He just left them. Some people are seeking for signs and sometimes those signs won't be be given, right? Right? Uh, uh, sure. All right. This is our pastor, by the way, getting in the way of our class time. Just so you know. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 48. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 48. The apostates kiss. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 48. Now this betrayer had given them a kiss, saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. And immediately when he went up to Jesus, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. Cataphileo, to kiss earnestly. Can you imagine that? Judas came up and kissed Christ earnestly, the apostate's kiss. That was the sign of his betrayal. And of course, we know that Judas was a, devil from the beginning. But we see that all throughout scripture, this sort of um, kiss with this sort of uh, earnest kiss that's given. Uh, Mark chapter 14 is a good example. Verses 44 and 45 of this situation as well. His betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him and lead him astray. And this is the the same example when they, they let him out. Let me go to Luke, yeah, chapter 7. Yes, Luke chapter 7 has to deal with the, the, the woman here. And Luke chapter 7, verses 38 and 40. 
Now the man in whom demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. Oh, that's chapter 8, I'm sorry. I'll get there. Chapter 7 and verse 38. Here we are. And he, and, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Verse 45, when addressing this Pharisee, Jesus said, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to earnestly kiss my feet since the time I came in. You see that? So you see it here. You see it in Acts chapter 20 when the people uh, with Paul had kissed him earnestly when he was, when he was leaving uh, as well. But you see these signs all throughout given to Israel. And that's what I want you to see. These signs are given all throughout to Israel. Jesus performed signs. And of course, you see this all throughout. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in John chapter 20, you see this in verses um, 30 and 31. Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples because they're looking for signs which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why were those signs given? For them to believe that Jesus is the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And you'll see this all throughout the Gospel of John. Now, what's interesting is John doesn't use the word dunamis, which is usually translated miracles. He uses the word simeon, which is signs, but he translates it miracles in most of, his, uh, most of the book here. In chapter 2, verses 23, chapter 3, 4, 6, and, and so forth, uh, on down the line. You see that, though. But it was to deepen their faith and to see God's glory. You can see that back in chapter 11. And you go back there where uh, he raises Lazarus. Chapter 11, verses uh, 15 and 45. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And this, then verse 45, it's talking about Lazarus. And many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed on him. Right? He didn't give him signs. He just went and he healed him. And then notice what it says in verse 40 in regards to that. Jesus said to her, did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And so it was set to deepen their faith and to see God's glory. So Jesus did many signs all throughout his ministry to confirm the message that he had been given, right? The disciples did signs. You can see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And again, this is all Jewish. This is all to the Jewish people. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. And you'll see that phrase used all throughout, signs, wonders, mighty deeds, right? The disciples will use the, it's attributed to the disciples. It's attributed to the Antichrist, the signs, wonders, and mighty deeds, and, and, and the false prophets as well uh, in the future. We can see the fullness of God in these signs, in, chap in Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. Let me read for you just a few verses there. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. And again, I just want you to see the depth of the signs that are given here. In chapter 2 and verse 30, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn by an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his, to sit on his throne. And that's not the verse I was looking for. Chapter 4 and verse 30 is what I'm looking for. Excuse me. Yeah. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your servant, Jesus. So they're done in the name of Jesus. You can see over in chapter 15. You look at chapter 15 and verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles, among the Gentiles. 
And then you see the Spirit's work in these as well in chapter 15 of Romans and verse 18. Romans chapter 15 and verse 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me and were indeed to make the Gentiles uh, obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. You see, it's done by the power of the Spirit of God. See that? So Jesus performed these signs. The apostles uh, performed these signs. And signs are, if you look at number eight, signs are, uh, or tongues are for a temporary sign. You see that? Matter of fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, we see something very interesting. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, we're told this, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease or pa'au. They will pause. Something will cause these tongues, these these. Tongues to cease. And of course, we know in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, it says that tongues are for a sign to unbelieving Jews. You look at Acts chapter 2, tongues are spoken in the, in, the, in the presence of unbelieving Jews. You look at Acts chapter 10, tongues are spoken in the presence of unbelieving Jews. You look at chapter 19, tongues are spoken in the presence of unbelieving Jews. Over and over again, you see the same thing that tongues are given for a sign, and it's a temporary sign. It's a sign of judgment. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And again, this goes back to the literal interpretation. When we're looking at these, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 49, talking about the cursings and things of that sort, Yahweh will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, Uh, As swift as an eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand. God says the judgment that's coming upon you in the end is deportation. Now, that's one of the judgment signs he gives. When you go to Isaiah chapter 28, he gives you the same thing here, verses 11 and 12 in Isaiah chapter 28. And notice verses 11 and 12, what he says here. For with stammering lips of another tongue, he will speak to his people to whom he said, rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, this is the Assyrian captivity that they're going to go into that he's talking about here. When you get over into Jeremiah, he's talking about the Babylonian captivity. And in chapter 5, You see that in verse 15. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from the house of Israel, says the Lord, a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. It's a judgment sign. Tongues were a judgment sign on Israel. God says, you are not going to listen to me. You will not hear me, even though I've divided up your languages. So what I'm going to do in the end is I'm going to send foreign nations to take you into deportation, into captivity. Now, when tongues are given, it is a sign that God has sent his people with his message. But it's still a judgment sign on the unbelief of the Jews. Because now salvation is going to the Gentiles. And that was foreign to them. And so God is saying, I'm going to judge you, and here's how I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge you by sending you or by giving these tongues, which the Jews require, right? And so that's what you see. And you see, that's the central message of God's messengers. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us this. Listen to Hebrews chapter 2 in the first several verses. And I apologize for my time. I wish I had more time here. How shall we escape if we... Neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. You see that? All of that is done for the Jews. Now, this, state, this brings us all the way up to number nine. And I think this is where we are, right here. 
You look at there was Moses and there was Elijah, there was Elisha and Elijah, there was Jesus and the apostles, and the next wave of signs that the Bible predicts is satanic signs. And we see this, we see this all throughout the scriptures. Not only that, but there are signs on earth and signs in heaven. I'm not sure if you realize this or you think about it, but that's what we're seeing here, that there's both signs on the earth and in heaven. Mark chapter 13, I think, is one of the passages that we can look at. Mark 13 and verse 22. Uh, so yes, yeah, so false Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, which that's what they always do, if possible, even the elect. You see that? So they've been given this power to do these signs and these wonders, if at all possible, to deceive the elect. This is what's done on the earth. You see this in First Timothy four and verse one. 1 Timothy four, uh, chapter four and verse one. Now the Spirit expressly says, in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. This is on the earth. Many would flee away from the truth and give heed to these mothos, these fables. These, and you see that today. I mean, think of all the nonsense that's spoken of on the radio today. There's 25 genders. Where did you get that from? Well, it's in my mind. Well, it must be true. No, it's not true. It's false. I mean, you see all kinds of nonsense going on today on the television. And that's the day in which we live today. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 13, and we might have to finish up on this one, but Matthew chapter 13, and notice again verses 13 and following, this is talking about the second beast, he performs great signs that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, he deceives, again, you always find that, he deceives those who dwell on the earth, and uh, by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's the power he was given. That's the power that he is going to be given, that he will have. You see that? You, see, you can see it in chapter 19 and verse 20 talks about this same thing here. Chapter 19 and verse 20. The beast was captured with him, the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, uh, those who, who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire with brimstone. See that? Again, they're performing signs and wonders. You can see it in 2 Thessalonians, speaking of this man of sin who I believe to be the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Same thing that Christ is given in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Same things the apostles were given in Hebrews chapter 2. He comes with all signs and wonders. Uh, false wonders uh, to deceive the people. But that's, that's not all. I mean, there's various demonic activity that's going on. Chapter 16 and verse 14, the fifth angel sounds, and then the sixth angel in chapter uh, 12, or excuse me, verse 12 of chapter 16 sound. And he tells us that these three unclean spirits in verse uh, 13 were like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. There are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world and gather them to, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. There are satanic beings who will gather everyone in the end to the battle of Armageddon through signs and through wonders. That's the next thing that's to happen uh, on the calendar, and that's in this earth. Now, that's not to mention the signs that we'll see in heaven in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12 and 15 and other places. Any other thoughts or questions uh, as we close? I know there's kind of a lot of information to you. I, 
I don't know where you're at and how much you understand, so I'm just kind of throwing this out there, and whatever you pick up, I hope will benefit you and help you. But I want you to see this. You're not looking for signs of Christ's return. You are looking for Christ to return. That's what you're looking for. You see that? Is it fair then to say that uh, the purpose for signs, one of the purposes for signs, it's a test for belief or unbelief? Because they're going to come. God, they're they're going to be given. Signs are going to be given either from God or through Satan. And they're going to test men's the genuineness of our faith. Would that be a per, one of the purposes of signs? Well, remember, what what is Satan wanting to do? What is your enemy wanting to do? Deceive. deceive. In what way? What is he wanting to deceive? The Bible starts off with a kingdom. Man and his, and his wife ruling God's creation for God on behalf of God. That's stolen away by the God of this world now. So what is God going to do now? so that he doesn't have egg on his face. He has to restore that kingdom. He's not just going to spiritualize it. He's not just going to let it go. But if Satan is to do that, he must destroy the Jews because the kingdom is not for the church. The church is not the kingdom. The kingdom is for Israel. And you'll see that by the characteristics laid out in scripture. Now you can, you can give them to the church and that's fine. And there will be uh, glorified believers there, but it is primarily given for God's people, the Jews, right? Any other thoughts? You're not allowed to answer my question with another question. <laughs> Say that again. What's I that? said you can't answer my question with another question. Oh, okay. Um, my question is... Do I do that a lot? <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. No, you're fine. Um, those who heal and do all those different signs and wonders, is that of Satan then? They're saying they're doing it in Jesus' name. Is that a sign like or assembly, satanic? Assembly of God believes and Pentecostals believe. With the signs and wonders that they do every What is your week? thought on that? What about the signs and wonders? No, no question I asked for the, the question, question, didn't I? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I do that a lot. 